Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Man, daylight savings really did people in today, huh? Holy cow. Well, we're glad that you're here, and we're glad for those of you that just stayed in your pajamas and showed up this morning. That's awesome to have a pajama jam today. So what is pajama? Pajama jam. I'm all messed up from last week. Pajama jam, whatever it is. But uh, wonderful Sunday. So glad for those of you that brought pajamas for the, to help people in need in our community. Thank you so much for doing that. We've got a great service plan for you. If you're new here, my name's Nolan. I'm the music director here at the church, and uh, we're just so glad that you're checking us out. If this is your first time, or maybe just second or third, and you're just kind of testing things out, testing the waters, um, we just want to let you know we're so glad that you're joining us today. We'd love to get a gift into your hands just to say thank you. So you can get that gift by heading to the table out in the lobby after service. If you're joining us online, just click the link that says, I'm new. Or even better, there's this number up on the screen. It says, uh, you can text welcome to that number and we'll just shoot you a text just to see who you are and let you know a little bit about our church, get you connected. We'd uh, love to know who you are. Anyway, well, thanks for checking us out. We've got a great morning plan for you today. We're continuing in the series called Ecclesia with uh, Andy Stanley, our teaching pastor. But right now we're gonna get in some singing together. So why don't you just stand up, just give somebody a wave around you or chat in online if you're joining us there and we'll get to it in just a sec.
Amen. What, what good news that is today, that we have a God that fights our battles for us, that when we're in the midst of it, when our weeks are crazy, when we're just feeling tired, we've got too much going on, that we can come to him and lay everything before his feet. He'll take care of us. We'll listen to him. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me Give it to him today. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
Warrior who you worship God. Come on, he's been the same. He is the same today. He has been forever. His ways are higher than our ways, and his love, it runs deep for us. So come on, let's make a commitment today to him that we will follow in his ways. If you curse me, then I will bless you. And if you hurt me, I will forgive. Let's declare that. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. Choose your way today. If you're helpless, I will defend you. And if you're burned, I'll share the weight. And if you're hopeless, then let me show you there's hope in the Jesus way. And I follow Thank you for that. I, I, I'm just loving that song. It's the song we used to, to kick off this series that we're in, Ecclesia, just a few weeks ago. And all the lyrics are about following in the way of Jesus. And for many of you, those lyrics are everything. But for some of you here today, I know that those lyrics are just that. They're just lyrics. They're just words up on a screen or on the wall. Maybe they used to mean something to you, but they don't 
mean much to you lately. And you're here today. Maybe you're sitting in the back, towards the back, right? You don't really know a lot of people, but you're here today because you're looking for something and, and you're hoping to find something. And I just want you to know if that's you, that we are so glad that you are here today and that we are for you. And more importantly, God is for you. And I just want to encourage you to keep on coming back because there's something about being in church and being around other people of faith that are following Jesus that can ignite or reignite your faith. So, so welcome. We are so, so glad that you're here. And I invite all of you now to just pray with me. Father, I just thank you for gathering us together this morning. I thank you for Jesus and that our hope is not found in our circumstances. Our hope, the hope that we're looking for and longing for is found in you. And I know that there's those here today, those joining us online that are hoping that that's true. And, and for them, I just pray that you would meet them right now exactly where they're at, exactly where they're at and that you would encourage them, that you would give them hope that they can find, they too can find what they're looking for in and through your son, Jesus. And I pray that you would meet us all where we're at today, that you would challenge us and change us through the message that we're about to hear, and that you would move us ever forward in our growing relationship with you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. You can take a seat. And once again, thanks for joining us today on this beautiful Daylight Savings Sunday. It's wonderful, isn't it? How many of you just love Daylight Savings? Right. You, I don't understand you if you're serious, because I don't. I went to bed a little early. Anybody try that? And I laid there for that hour that I'm not used to going to bed early. And then uh, I woke up this morning to the reality of it all. Um, but it's good. And there's extra coffee. Let's give it up for our guest service team that's uh, brewing some extra coffee this morning. Uh, it's so awesome. And for all of our volunteers that are here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Those of you joining us online. Uh, if we haven't met yet, uh, my name's Jame, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here. And I absolutely love this church and all that God does through it on Sunday mornings that we get to gather, we get to gather online. Um, but I really love what goes on in and throughout the week as well. And so there's a couple of things that I want to highlight that are going on that we just don't want you to miss. We think that you're going to love. And you can always find out more by visiting the Northbridge Top 3. We call that the NB Top 3 on our website or app or just scanning that QR code. If you're new, there's a QR code on a seat around you. Scan that. It's going to let you find out more and there'll be helpful links and stuff like that. But, but one of the things I want to let you know about is called Connect. So if you're new, relatively new, you've been around for a week, maybe it's your first Sunday, a couple of months, and you want to get connected, you just don't feel connected quite yet, we want to make that as easy as possible uh, for you to make this church your church. And so we have a super informal environment we call Connect. It's actually a lunch it's going to be happening next week after the second service, okay, starting around 1230. Then all you need to do is register. It's completely free. If you have children in our family ministry environments, we'll continue to watch them during this hour. So that's two hours of child care if you're counting. That's reason enough to stay for Connect. And we're going to get pizza and stuff for them as well. Um, so we'd love to meet you. You get to meet the staff, people that are just like you, relatively new and looking to connect. And you get to hear a little bit more about the heart of the church. So it's always a good time. One of my favorite things that we get to do here uh, as a staff to just meet all of you that are taking that step and getting connected. So register for that today so you can be part of it next week. And when you register, just let us know what kind of sandwich you want. You'll get it. It's all on the registration form. Um, speaking of food, we have a big food build that's going to be happening um, in just a few weeks on April 13th. This is a tradition for us here at Northbridge. Through your generosity, we get to package a whole bunch of uh, package and purchase a whole bunch of rice and beans and vitamin packets. But we're going to package that stuff into about 40,000 meals that gets distributed to our global nonprofit partners and through them to people in need all around the world. And we really do need you to help make this happen. We need just over a hundred of you. So many of you have already registered, but if you haven't, this is a way that you can just be a part of something good and make a huge impact for people all around the world um, just by giving a few hours of your Saturday morning. And so you can register for all three hours, nine until noon, or one of the hour and a half shifts. You can do nine to 10.30 or 10.30 to 12. 
everything's ready for you. All you need to do is be a part of it. You can register by scanning that QR code, going to the Northbridge top three. Families, come do this together. Small groups, talk to your small group, come do this together. Great opportunity to invite a friend as well. Maybe they're not that interested in church, but they would love to do something good. This is a great first step to invite that person and come and experience this church that you love uh, and something incredible that we get to do together for others. Last thing, pardon me, I want to let you know about is a parenting class uh, course that we're having, a short small group, a short circle, if you will, led by Andy and Sandra. It's going to be starting on Tuesday, April 7th. It's for parents, grandparents, anybody really that works, coaches, teaches maybe, um, students um, at any stage of life. This is so much wisdom, helpful, helpful content. Um, you can register for that today and find out more by visiting the Northbridge Top 3. Right now, we're going to continue to worship um, through a time of giving. We're going to have the morning offering. Instructions on how you can give and be a part of that are on the screens behind me, your screen at home. Um, there's online giving, text to give. You can set up reoccurring giving. And there is a drop box for those of you here in the house at the back of the room that would like to use that at some point this morning as well. So thank you for your generosity. As we take a few moments to give, we're going to be syncing up with our partner churches for a live message today from Andy Stanley as we continue our current series with part four. The series is called Ecclesia, and we've been talking about the church and how it's so much more than just a building. And it's so much better than just an hour on Sundays when people gather. It was always meant to be, meant to be a movement. Here's Andy. You're just one of eight billion on this blue cosmic ball. So many characters with their roles to play. Perhaps many, if not most, still finding their way. Some who are given to athletic pursuits, while others find joy on educational routes. Those who build and those who farm. Those who sell widgets using their charm. But aren't we more than what we do? Being one of eight billion should give us a clue. On our own, it's difficult to make a big dent. Brokenness and need refuse to relent. Perhaps we were designed for a much grander endeavor. Not toiling alone, but pulling together. The planet is large. This much is true. But when God calls his people, there's so much we can do. Solve the world's problems? That does sound absurd. But maybe we can start with this strange little word. I want to welcome all of our Atlanta area churches and those of you who are watching literally from all over the world, all over the state of Georgia. Um, it's just so fun to have and be a part of a growing network of men and women and children and students who are beginning to understand what it means not simply to believe in Jesus, but to follow Jesus. Because we believe it's doing that makes the difference. And that's what Jesus taught and what he's called us to do. And the difference that you're making, the difference you're making in your community, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, as most of you know, my dad was a pastor um, and he would often say to me when he knew I was going into ministry, he would say, Andy, if you preach from your weakness, you'll never run out of material. And I didn't know whether to take this personally or not. And then I would hear him say this to other pastors when he would talk to pastors, he would say, if you preach from your weakness, you'll never run out of material. And that is absolutely true. Um, now I work way ahead when it comes to sermon preparation, um, three or four weeks ahead. And one of the advantages of that is it gives me an opportunity to look in the mirror to make sure um, that I don't have work to do before I get up here and tell all of you what you need to do. And honestly, today's topic um, is a reminder to me as I looked in the mirror that this is something that I have allowed to slip, that this used to be so front and center for me, but over time it just slipped and I've drifted. And, and I don't like that because this is so important. I want this to be front and center for me. I want to get this right. And I want all of us to get this right, because I think if we all get this right, that maybe God will do something unusual through our churches and through you and in our communities and in the world. So 
Here we go. Today we're in part four of our series, if you've been tracking along with us, ekklesia, strange little word. Ekklesia is actually the Greek term used to describe um, the Jesus movement in the first century. In the Greek New Testament, this is the word that appears to describe his movement. His movement was, of course, informed by his teaching, the teaching of Jesus. It was fueled by his death and his resurrection. Um, We call this movement, of course, the church, but the word ekklesia doesn't mean church. The word ekklesia literally means assembly. And specifically in the first century, it meant an assembly of people called together to do something specific. And in, the, in Jesus' case, it was an assembly of people devoted to following him, living out his kingdom of God ethic, and then inviting the entire world to join in to live out that very same ethic. So in this series, here's what we've been doing. This is part four. We're taking a few weeks to look back at the first century church in order to, or to ensure that we stay on track. That we're looking back at their story, their storyline, how they acted, reacted, how they loved, how they responded in order to stay on track because those first century Christians, this is amazing, they literally sat at the feet of Jesus. They understood firsthand what Jesus had in mind when he launched his ecclesia or when he launched his assembly or his movement because they were part of the very first iteration of the movement or we would say the very first iteration of the church in the world. And while expressions of faith um, change from generation generation to generation, um, while expressions of the Christian faith change from culture to culture, different cultural expressions, Jesus' original mission for his assembly for us has not changed. So we can't afford to lose sight of his original intent because as you know, historically, when the church veers, things get weird. When the church veered, things get weird. Or to put it a different way, when the church loses its way, people pay. When the church loses its way, culture pays because the foundation for human dignity and human rights slips away. I mean, to put it simply, we could spend a lot of time on this and you know this, if there is no God, if there is no God, then there is no absolute standard for right and wrong. If the standard for right and wrong is inside of me, then I get to choose what's right for me and what's right for you. But if there's a standard outside of us that we all appeal to, then culture has something to appeal to. So if there is no God, there's no one to determine what's right and what's wrong, or to borrow an Old Testament phrase that you might be familiar with. When there is no God in a culture, then everyone does what's right in their own eyes. So there is so much at stake when it comes to the church getting this right. We've gotta get it right and we've gotta keep the church upright and we've gotta keep the church on mission. Because as I've said throughout this series, and this is difficult for us to comprehend, We, when you think about us and our network of churches and the churches all over the world, we in this generation, we are the church for our generation. When people outside the church or outside of faith or people who've left the Christian faith think about or look at the church, they don't look at the first century church. They don't look at the last century church. They look at us. They look at the churches in their community and they determine, oh, that's what the church is all about. So we are the representation of the ecclesia of Jesus for our generation. So we gotta get it right. <laughs> but it's, it's even worse than that or better than that, depending on how you look at it. You as individuals and I as an individual, we represent what Christianity looks like. You know, what are Christians all about? Well, people don't pick up the New Testament to say, what are, what are Christians all about? They look at me. And they look at you and they look at us. So we have to get this right individually, which means we have to figure out how to assume the tone and the posture and the approach of our king because we are ambassadors and representatives of our king individually and we are representatives of the ecclesia, the Jesus movement collectively. So we are looking back to stay on track, studying the actions and reactions of the men and women who launched this thing 2,000 years ago. So we've been following the storyline in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the history of the early church written by Luke, who wrote, also wrote the gospel of Luke. And he said that he thoroughly investigated all of these things. And we know that Luke knew the apostles, knew Luke actually traveled with the apostles, traveled with the apostle Paul specifically. So we're looking at the storyline. So quick, a quick recap. I'll catch you up if you haven't been following along. So a few weeks, just a few weeks, not years, a few weeks after the resurrection, Jews from all over the Roman empire, primarily men, came to the city of Jerusalem for a festival, the festival of weeks or the festival of Pentecost. And while they were there, Peter and John and the other apostles, the men and women who had seen the resurrected Jesus go into the busy streets of Jerusalem and they begin to proclaim that God has done something new 
in the world for the world that he has sent Messiah or he has sent his final king who has established righteousness in the world. He's come for the entire world. And they said, and the reason we know that Jesus of Nazareth was God's final king is because he was crucified right outside of these walls. They're in the city of Jerusalem, right outside of these walls. And God raised him from the dead and we have seen him. We didn't read about it. We didn't hear about it. We are eye witnesses. And so they begin to preach to the people in the street. And as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, when Peter closes this message, here's how he closes the message. Again, there's hundreds of people in the street. They're hear hearing him preach in the city of Jerusalem. Again, this is where all these things took place. He said, repent, that is change your mind, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Now we read this as Christians and we're like, yeah, you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This was radical. Wait a minute. I mean, the whole idea of baptism was kind of foreign to them as Jews because they were already Jews. Generally, people who were baptized when they were sort of joining Judaism. And Peter say, no, this is a brand new thing. There's something new for you to identify with. That's what baptism is. It's identifying with someone. And you need to identify with Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the King, who is the Messiah. And because these men and women had seen the resurrected Jesus, here's what happened. The text says, and those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So opening day for the ecclesia, <clears throat> it was amazing. The ecclesia actually opened on day one as an outward facing, and this is the challenge for every local church. It's a challenge for us. The ecclesia opened as an outward facing, multicultural, because the men who had come to Jerusalem for this festival came from all over the empire, multicultural, multiplying movement. Because Jesus' final admonition was, I want you to go and make disciples of me in every single nation. So here's what happened after that. <clears throat> The apostles continue to preach and teach. The crowds continue to grow. And many of the people who had come to Jerusalem for the festival stayed because something new and unusual was happening. And the crowds got so big. Now, again, these are all Judeans. These are Jews and sons and daughters of Abraham from all over the world. They began to migrate and meet at the temple. This is a problem. Now, if you've ever seen a picture of the ancient, um, of Herod's temple in Jerusalem, uh, it's about 38 acres of a stone plaza that's elevated with walls and doors that come into it. And then in the middle of this 30 something acre, you know, basically patio is the actual temple structure where the Holy of Holies is and the curtains and the different chambers and where they would actually sacrifice animals. So now these Jesus followers are gathering <laughs> at the holiest site of, you know, ancient Judaism to talk about someone who's basically come to replace the entire system. So this doesn't sit well with the high priest. Uh, again, those who benefit most from the status quo, we talk about this, those that benefit most from the status quo are usually least inclined to let it go. So Luke tells us, he's very specific, that one afternoon, at three o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John, who are the leaders of the Jesus movement, go to the temple to meet with other Christians to pray. And as they're going through this particular, these particular stairs, through this particular gate, there is a man who has been lame from birth. If you grew up in church, you've heard this story. Lame from birth, begging. Now, this is an unusual situation because in the first century, in the first century, the thought was, and you see this throughout the gospels and the teaching of Jesus, um, as Jesus interacted with people, the assumption was if somebody was lame or paralyzed or disfigured or blind, that they had sinned and their physical ailment was payment for their sin. In fact, later, some years later, there was a rabbinic tradition that encouraged anyone, this is hard for us to imagine, a rabbinic tradition that encouraged anyone who encountered someone who was blind or lame or disfigured, as you walk by them, you were to look at that person and say, blessed be the righteous judge. Blessed be the righteous judge. It was your way of saying, this person is getting what they deserve and their suffering is a reflection of the righteous judge, our God. This person is getting what they deserve. But if you read the gospels, Jesus didn't buy that. And Peter and John, <laughs> they didn't buy it either because they're followers of Jesus. So this man is begging, he's asking for money. You remember this story and Peter says, okay, <clears throat> we're broke. We don't, we don't have any money. But what I do have, I'm gonna give you in the name 
of Jesus Christ, Jesus the King, in the name of Jesus the King of Nazareth, I want you to stand up and walk. And this man who had been a fixture by this particular gate for many years stands up and he's healed. And what does he do? He follows them up the stairs, up to the temple courts. And people see him in a, not a riot, but a celebration breaks out. They have been literally looking down on this man his whole life. And now they are eye to eye and something amazing has happened. And it creates quite a scene. And part of the reason it was a scene, maybe you remember a little song, if you grew up in church like me about this guy, he was walking and jumping and praising God. That would create a scene if that happened in church, right? He was walking and jumping or walking and leaping and praising God. Of course he was. He had been a beggar. He'd been poor his whole life. He had been looked down upon and and considered a sinner who was ceremonially unclean and could never actually enter the temple. And now God had done a miracle and the crowd swells. And then Peter does what Peter always did when there was a crowd. He preached and he assured this crowd that what had happened, the reason this man was walking and had been healed was that it had happened in the name of Jesus of of Nazareth. And then at the end of his sermon, he leans in. Now remember where they are. They're on the temple courts. I mean, they can, you know, they can throw a stone and hit the actual temple. They're right there in the holiest side of Judaism. And he leans in and Peter says this, You, talking about that group of people, you killed the author of life right outside these walls. But God, he goes back to the theme of his message, but God raised him from the dead and we, Peter and John and the disciples of Jesus, we are witnesses of this. We have seen the risen Jesus. And then he says, repent. And then he kind of goes over the line. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be erased so that your sins might be wiped away. This is too much for the temple leaders. This is like, this is, this is over the line because sins being taken away through the death of a mere mortal, this is absolute blasphemy. And it had to stop. And the reason it had to stop was this, the entire temple structure, the entire temple system was built around erasing or atoning for the sins of men and women. And now here they are again within a stone's throw of the temple saying, this building is no longer relevant. This temple is no longer needed. And they shouldn't have been surprised because Jesus actually said at one point during his ministry, he said, he claimed to be, this was astounding. It made no sense at the time. He claimed to be greater than the temple. And when Jesus said he was greater than the temple, this made, how can you be greater than the temple? But now they understood Because Jesus came to do single-handedly what the temple could never have done for hundreds and hundreds of years, erase the sin of men and women and create a clear standing with God, their father. So the priest, they, this, this is going to undermine the entire temple system. So the priest ordered the temple guard to arrest Peter and John, but many who heard the message believed them. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000 people. So they take Peter and John, they put him in jail. When we think about jail, we think about somebody opening a door and putting somebody in. That's not how it worked. When you went to jail in those days, they lowered you down in a hole too deep to climb out. That was jail. They put a lid over it. And there had been other people in that hole. And there's no drainage in that hole. We'll just end it there. So they spend the night individually in the dark in the worst possible environment. And here's what they're thinking, okay? The men who had them arrested are the same men who had Jesus arrested and ultimately talked Pilate into uh, crucifying Jesus. So they know their lives are at risk. If they had the power to get rid of the head of this movement, surely Pilate's gonna give them permission to get rid of Peter and John. So this may be their last night on earth for all they know. So the next day, The chief priest and the elders and the high priest bring them out for a public trial, which was a huge mistake. They bring them out in the open to basically threaten the people of the Jesus movement to say, hey, this is what's gonna happen to you if you keep talking about this Jesus of Nazareth. So they have this public public trial. Again, these are the same men who tried Jesus and had Jesus crucified. There's Annas, the high priest, the elders, the whole group. And because it's a public trial, guess who else shows up? The lame man but he's standing up. 
which was a real awkward, awkward moment for the men who were trying to prove that these men had done something blasphemous because everybody in the area knows this is a miracle. It was a public miracle. We all have seen this guy for years begging. So when they finished telling Peter and John what they can and can't do, they give Peter an opportunity to respond, which was a big mistake because he preaches another sermon. And at the end of it, now think of this, he is face to face with the high priest. He is face to face with the relatives of the high priest. These are the most powerful people in the city in all of Judaism in the first century. And he looks at them and he says, it is by the name of Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, King of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Now he's specific. You guys, we know you were behind the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. Everybody knows that. And it's in the name of the man you crucified and that God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. And I love this next line so much. When they saw, this is when the high priest and when all the elders, when all the group that are, you know, to trying Peter and John, trying to get rid of this movement. When they saw the courage, I love this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, Peter and John should have been on their knees begging for mercy. They'd seen crucifixion. They'd seen the aftermath of crucifixion. There was no guarantee that anybody was gonna raise them from the dead. When they died, they would stay dead. They were risking their lives, not for what they believed. They were risking their lives for what they had seen, their resurrected rabbi. When they saw the courage, <clears throat> when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that these were unschooled, uneducated, they were fishermen, they were from Galilee, they were, they were, they were day laborers, they'd never been to school, they were probably illiterate. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that these are unschooled, ordinary men, they're not powerful men, they, they shouldn't have the nerve to face us down. They were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see, and this was the problem, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they warned them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore or else. And Peter's response, <laughs> Peter responded, <clears throat> we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and we have heard. Now, real quick, this is so important. Then we'll get back to the storyline. I want you to understand because I, I talk about this all the time. I mention this all the time and I don't know if it, you know, if it, it sticks. I, I, we gotta make this stick. The foundation of their faith in Jesus, the reason they chose to follow Jesus the rest of their life was not what Jesus taught They'd heard everything Jesus taught, but when Jesus was arrested, they ran. The reason they decided to follow Jesus for the rest of their life was because God raised him from the dead. The foundation of their faith, the foundation of the faith of the first followers of Jesus, as we're looking back in order to stay on track, the foundation of their faith was an event the resurrection of Jesus. And it was the resurrection that launched the movement, the ecclesia. And it's the ecclesia that years later would produce our Bible. It was an event that launched a movement that brought us our Bible. But what anchored them to Jesus was they were eyewitnesses of an event. And now more than ever, I'm convinced, we must anchor the faith of this generation and the next generation to the event that launched the movement that eventually brought us the Bible. It's why over and over and over in the book of Acts, whenever Peter speaks and whenever Peter teaches, he always comes back, not to the prodigal son, not to the good Samaritan, not to the Sermon on the Mount. He always comes back to the event that galvanized the movement because Jesus was who he claimed to be. That is the foundation of their faith. It was the foundation of their faith. And if you're a believer, that's the foundation of your faith as well. It's why we choose to follow Jesus, as I say all the time. Anyone who predicts their own death and resurrection and pulls it off, you should do whatever that person says, right? And that is exactly why they came out of hiding and why they chose <clears throat> to follow Jesus. I'm finally gonna get some water because I know some of you want me to. <clears throat> some of you wanna rush up here with the water bottle, okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> I don't know about the rest of you. I got up an hour earlier this morning. Anyway, 
So, okay, so here's what happened then. So now they're released. It's like the, the, the high priest says, okay, you're, you're released, you can go, but enough of this. So what do they do next? This is where the story intersects my life. This is where the story intersects. If you're a Christian, your life. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Jesus follower, if we would allow what happens next to intersect our lives, I think you would have less resistance to the church and less resistance to Christians. This this is why the gospel and the story of Jesus survived the first century. Here's what happened next. This is amazing. Luke tells us. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. So there's a core of men and women who are eyewitnesses of the resurrection. They are sticking together, organizing, trying to figure out what's next, this growing movement in this this city that's packed full of residents and strangers. Went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. So they get back and they're like, what happened, what happened? It's like, well, they threatened us with our life and they said to quit speaking in the name of Jesus or else. And after they had made their report, Luke tells us when they heard this, this whole group heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Pause. Don't answer out loud. What what would you have prayed for if you had been them? What, what What would we have prayed for if we were in their situation? What ask myself, what would I have prayed for? If I was in their situation, what, let me make it more personal. What, what do we pray for? What do you pray for? Or who do we pray for? Who, if you pray, who, who do you pray for? And honestly, when we hold up what we pray for and who we pray for beside the first century Christians from whom we're supposed to take our your cue, it's a little bit embarrassing. Here's what the first century church, here's what the first century persecuted church prayed for. If, if we're going to go back and get in sync with how this whole thing started, this is a bit instructional as well as it is <clears throat> convicting. Here's what they prayed for. They said, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. It's like, what does it have to do with anything? Everything. They're like, God, before we ask you for anything, we just want to proclaim you are large and you are in charge. And then they rehearsed God's past faithfulness to their people and God's past faithfulness to them. And then as part of their prayer, they actually rehearsed current events. This is so powerful. Part of their prayer, they said, indeed, Lord, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Romans, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. And we know that they did, they only did what you allowed them to do. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In other words, God, we know none of this took you by surprise. God, it took us by surprise, but it didn't take you by surprise because you are the sovereign God in whom we trust. So why should we be afraid? And then their prayer request. Here's what we're asking for. In light of all that, God, (laughs) now, Lord, it's amazing. Consider their threats and enable or empower your servants, talking about themselves, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be bold. Now, this is amazing because Peter and John still smell like the hole they spent the night in. Peter and John still smell like jail. And they're asking for Boldness, to which we'd say, whoa, 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 boldness. Look, boldness almost got you killed. You, you guys should pray for, let, let, you, know, you know, us Americans, let, me, let us help you guys know what you, men and women, what you should pray for. Here's what you should pray for. You should pray for diplomacy, discretion, and definitely protection. This is what you should ask for, not boldness. We think you got boldness covered and boldness almost got you killed. You need diplomacy, discretion, and you need to ask God, to protect you. Instead, they were asking for courage to speak up, even when it would be safer to keep their mouths shut. And then they continued with their prayer. They said, God, 
just as Peter and John healed that lame man, would you continue to work through us in wondrous ways so that people know that we represent the God of heaven and stretch out your hand through us to heal and to do things that cause people to take notice so that we can give credit to our King, Jesus of Nazareth. And Luke says that after they prayed for boldness, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And the result, they spoke the word of God boldly. <clears throat> and I hold that up against my prayer life and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Because if I'm not intentional, I know I'm the pastor, I should know better. I mean, I can quote prayers from the New and Old Testament. If I'm not careful, my prayers are all about me and my family and my kids and my friends and my sick friends. And oftentimes it just never gets outside of that circle. My prayers are like your prayers. Our prayers are an indicator, right? Right? <laughs> What we pray, what do we pray about? We pray about what we're concerned about. And that's something to think about. And here's what it makes me think about. Am I concerned about what God is concerned about? Am I really concerned about what God, my heavenly father and my savior is most concerned about? If, if God answered all of my prayers, who would benefit the most. If God answered all of your prayers, who would benefit the most? If my prayers are exclusively or even primarily about me and the people closest to me, does that mean my faith is all about me? If our prayers collectively as a group of churches, if our prayers collectively as a group of churches are all about us or primarily about us, does it mean that over time, our faith is just all about us? What it means at a minimum is we're nothing like the folks in the early church. But what if we were? What if we were? What, what, if, concerned, what if what concerned us? What if what concerned us is what concerns our king? And in addition to praying for ourselves and our family and our kids and their jobs and their futures and our sick friends and all the things that we should pray for, what if in addition we prayed outside the circle of what most impacted us directly and prayed in accordance with what God, our heavenly father is up to in the world and what he is up to in our communities? I wonder what would happen. Actually, I think I know what would happen because again, our prayers are an indicator we, we pray for what we're most, we pray about what we're most concerned about. So if I could be so bold, I wanna invite all of us to join me and pray for boldness. <clears throat> now, this has nothing to do with handmade signs. This has nothing to do with street preaching. This has nothing to do with standing outside of sporting events, right? Boldness, not rudeness. We've actually been called as Christians to live our lives in such a way that we gain the respect of people. We've been called to live our lives in such a way that people outside our faith would look at us and say, you know, I don't believe what they believe, but they're some of the finest people in our community and I'm glad they're my neighbors. I'm glad my son married one of them. I'm glad my daughter married one of them. I love to employ them. I love to work for them. That's, what we're, that's the kind of life we're called to live in our culture. And if you're not a Christian and you push back against the church and you push back against Christianity, it's probably because you met the rude version of us, not the bold version of us. We're instructed to live in such a way that, that we win the respect of outsiders. So let me define what I mean by bold within the context of our culture and our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our communities and our spheres of influence. Boldness is simply... The courage to speak up when, we, when fear whispers, keep your mouth shut. It, it's simply the courage to speak up because you know you need to say something or you should say something because you're concerned about this person or that you sort of feel an internal nudge, say something. It's the courage to speak up when fear just whispers, just keep your mouth shut. F fear says, look, just pray for her, pray for him, but you don't need to say anything. I mean, it's none of your business. Besides, you, you're gonna offend them. 
Boldness, the courage to speak up when fear whispers, just keep your mouth shut. For me, if I just be so transparent for a minute, <clears throat> for me, and if, if this, I hope you don't lose respect, but this just, again, this is where I feel convicted. Um, in our communities, people recognize me and they'll come up and, and I'm like a confession booth, okay? People walk up, they, don't, they won't even enter. I always have to stop and say, what was your name? You just told me like your biggest sin. I don't know your name yet, okay? What could we, anyway. And that's okay. That's just part of being a pastor in a community that happens to pastors all the time. People will come up and start pouring out their heart. And as they're talking, I'm having an internal conversation. I'm not even sure who the conversation is with, okay? So I don't, I don't know. But the conversation is like, Andy, you should pray for this person right now. Oh, I don't want to pray for them out loud. We're, we're standing in a mall, we're standing at a restaurant, we're at a food court, we're in a rest, we're in line, you know, and I'm, they're pouring out their heart and they're being so transparent and I'm feeling prompted to pray for them right there in the moment out loud. And I'm arguing with God or myself or whatever, whoever, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Last time this happened, it was CVS. And I remember specifically, <clears throat> I'm standing next to the battery display and there's the front counter and a gentleman came up and just poured out his heart to me. And I'm inside, I'm thinking, Andy, you need to pray for this guy right now. And I'm like, it'll be embarrassed. What if, da, 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 da. I mean, how silly. And I finally just broke through and said, can I pray for you right now? And he's like, no. <laughs> Tears, he said, would you please? I just put my hand on his shoulder and prayed. Why is that so hard? Why would I resist that? I'm the pastor. I'm, I'm, a prof I'm paid to pray, okay? This is ridiculous, right? I'm a public prayer everywhere I go. I do the blessing. I close the thing. Andy, would you pray for us? I mean, that's what I do, right? So why would I not, besides that, imagine getting kicked out of CVS for praying somebody. It's a great sermon illustration. You would hear about it, okay, right? <clears throat> so you have your own version of this. You feel like I should say, I mean, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I don't say it right? What if, what if, what if, what if? You know what boldness is? Boldness is, oh, that's fear talking. Boldness is, oh, that's insecurity talking. <laughs> boldness is, I don't think God is telling me to keep my mouth shut. So boldness is speaking up when fear says you keep your mouth shut. And here's the thing. If we, and I'm including myself, okay. If we're not asking for boldness, we're gonna miss opportunities to be bold because we're not looking for them. But I promise you, I promise you, because I've been back in this game, me and Sandra, but we just talk about this all the time now. When you're praying for boldness, when the opportunities come along, you'll know and you're more likely to do. And besides that, aren't you glad, come on, even if you're not a religious person or a Christian person, look up here. Aren't you glad somebody was bold with you at some point in your life? You were in a toxic relationship and they pointed it out and they rescued you. you. You had a habit or a thing that was taken over your life and somebody stuck their nose in your business and you were offended at first. In fact, you were angry at first. And now when you tell your story, the story of your life, they're part of your story because not because they prayed for you silently and quietly and definitely not because they left the conversation and you know told somebody else. They, they came directly to you and they were bold with you. Aren't you grateful? Do you know you have the opportunity, I have the opportunity to be that voice, that, that point of contact with people I know and people I don't know. So why would we not be like the first century church and say, God, empower us and remind us to speak your word boldly, not rudely, boldly. So here's the challenge for all of us, okay? <clears throat> I want you to pray this prayer every single day between now and Easter. That's three weeks from now, or whenever you're watching this, it may be three months from now, sorry. But anyway, I want you to pray, that, pray this prayer every single day between now and Easter, it's three weeks. And so I wrote out a prayer and to make Sandra happy, I made it rhyme. So here's, here's, here's what I've been praying. Here's what we started praying. Heavenly Father, give me the courage to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. Heavenly Father, give me the courage to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. Heavenly Father, today, as I go to work, today, today as I'm out, today, would you give me the courage to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut? Now, if this is scary for you, that's great because anything that stretches your faith makes it stronger. Faith is a muscle. This is your opportunity and my opportunity, our opportunity to exercise that muscle. So all together, let's just try it all together. If you're watching online or you're driving, just everybody out loud together. Ready? One, two, three. Heavenly Father, give me the courage to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. 
So this past week, knowing I was gonna challenge you with this, I challenged our staff. About four or five times a year, we have an all staff meeting. All of our Atlanta area campuses, it's about 500 people in this group who I love <clears throat> that serve you week after week and serve our churches. So I said, hey, I've been praying this and I'm, I'm gonna challenge our whole congregation to pray this. And so as a staff, I need you to lead the way. Let's pray. So the next day on Slack, of our inner, you know, our inner campus uh, communication channel, Slack here at North Point Community Church specifically, um, one of the women on our staff posted this. Here's, here's what she posted. She said, the boldness prayer from yesterday's staff meeting worked fast. After work yesterday, I had my emissions tested. After it was finished, after it was finished, and I had thanked the young woman who did the work, I was pulling away, and then I paused, and I leaned out the window and blurted out, hey, do you have a church home? Now that's bold, right? But, you know, kind of bold. She's already pulling away. It's like, I'm already out of here, but just, no, I'm just kidding. So it's like, but the point is, the point is, this was on her mind because we just talked about it. It's like, okay, I don't know this woman. I've never, do you have a church home? She responded that she'd never heard of North Point Community Church. I rambled on about our amazing kids' environments. She looked up the website and I asked her to come sit with me. She's coming on March the 17th with her three kids, 10, nine, and seven. And I love this part. It's been a while since I had kids in Upstreet. If someone could please help out, that would be, I would be grateful. Here's why this is important. Here's a woman who doesn't have kids in this environment, meet somebody with kids, but instead of like, oh, I'm not their age, I don't know what to do. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm inviting and then we'll figure out the details later. Now, let me ask you a question. Is, I don't know who she invited and I don't know if she'll actually show up with her kids, but is she grateful or offended? It, Imagine what might happen to a 10-year-old and a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old that are raised in these fabulous environments that you create and pay for week after week after week. Who knows? This could be the beginning, not of a story, but of four or five stories. Just because it's like, oh yeah, almost missed my opportunity. Heavenly Father, give me the courage to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. The point of our series is to look back so that we stay on track. The early church, they were bold. They were confident and they were courageous. Not because of their temperament and not because of their personalities, because of their faith in Jesus. So let's be like them. Let's be the ecclesia of Jesus. Let's be the assembly of our King. And let's pray for boldness. Let's speak up when fear and insecurity say, no, you'd be better off just keeping your mouth shut. And then let's see what happens. It could be amazing. And we will pick it up right there next time in part five of Ecclesia. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Forgive us for missing the opportunities we've missed because we were in a hurry and so consumed about our stuff. And I include myself in that, Father. Just forgive us. We didn't mean to. We're just busy and distracted and it's just life. So, Father, in addition to praying for our family and our friends and our loved ones and the people who are dealing with medical challenges and you know family challenges and prodigal kids and all those things that we need to pray for, just... Would you just prompt us to get just one circle outside of that circle and pray for the unknown person that we've yet to meet, yet to interact with and help us to be bold and help us to live a life in such a way that we are winsome in our lives so that when we make those invitations, when we jump into somebody else's life, when we kind of not mind our own business, that there would be something so Christ-like about us that people would lean in like we leaned in when somebody confronted us. So please give us the wisdom to know what to do with this. Give us the courage to do it. And Father, would you, just as that early church prayed, would you do something amazing and wonderful and unexpected in our midst as we experience your power manifested through our 
faith-filled boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, we want to be a people that are applying what we're learning and being challenged with each and every Sunday. And so we've got some questions for you uh, as you get ready to leave and on your way home. And some of you will revisit these throughout the week in small group. But question one, who was bold with you about their faith that positively impacted your faith? Talk about that on the way home. What's your primary pushback to asking God for boldness? And then once again, that prayer, would you be willing to start the next seven days, not just between now and Easter, but can you make a commitment just about the next seven days with that prayer. Heavenly Father, give me the courage to speak up when fear tells me to keep my mouth shut. Now, if you're anything like me, I can say, yes, I'm willing to make that commitment. And then by two o'clock today, I've forgotten about that commitment because life came at me pretty fast, you know? And so we've got a reminder for you on your way out. We had these vinyl stickers slash clings printed up. We want you all to take one, okay? You can put this on your bathroom mirror. Some of you are going to look at that a whole bunch each and every day, right? Maybe that's not the best place for you. Maybe put it around a water bottle. If you've got a Stanley, this will wrap around it perfectly. Maybe you've got a notebook, you're a student put it on the front of a notebook, whatever works for you. But it's got that prayer. It says be bold. And then there's kind of, it's not really a blank, but you could look at it as a blank. Maybe you already know who you should be bold with or where you should be bold. Maybe it's a conversation with someone, a prayer for someone, whatever it is. Or maybe you just want to keep looking at that as the real reminder that it is that these opportunities come up several times each and every day, as long as we're looking for them and listening for them. So take one of these out there and let's be people that are bold this week and in the weeks ahead. Thanks so much for joining us. Next week, we're continuing the series with part five. Um, And so stay connected with us on social media between now and then. And also Easter is coming. And so if you want information about our Easter services, same time, but a bigger Sunday, and uh, also Good Friday services that weekend, all of that info can be found on our website. So you can prepare and invite people, bold invites between now and then. All right, have a good one. Go in peace.